the last lecture of our physics module, we're going to go into research, the design and the execution of it. Every one of you at this point should know what the scientific method is. The scientific method goes as follows. One, you generate a testable question. Two, you gather data and resources. Three, you form a hypothesis. Four, you collect new data. Five, you analyze the data. Six, you interpret the data and the existing hypothesis you made earlier. Seven, you publish. And eight, you verify your results. As scientists, you all should be very familiar with this by now. How do we f determine whether a research question will add to the body of scientific knowledge in a practical way? And will it be in done in a reasonable time period? Well, this is where the finer method comes into play. The finer method is executed by asking multiple questions about the research in question. The first is, is the research, is the necessary research study going to be feasible? Two, do other scientists find this question interesting? Three, is this particular question novel? Four, would the study obey ethical principles? And five, is the question relevant outside the scientific community? So, finer. Is the research feasible? Is it interesting, novel, ethical, and relevant? Control and causality. These are things that we talk about during experimentation. They are necessary to execute the scientific method. Controls can exist as positive or negative. Positive controls ensure a change in the dependent variable when expected. Negative ensures that no change in the dependent variable occurs when no change is expected. When you're designing an experiment, take note of these and how they will control your outcomes. Causality. There are two variables that go into causality. The first is the independent variable, which is the variable that is manipulated. The, t the dependent variable is the observed variable that hinges on the independent variable. Oftentimes, the dependent variable is the area of interest for a study. Error sources. We're all human, and as such, we're not perfect. So there is a chance that error will bleed into even our best efforts at being objective. The first error source is with accuracy. Accuracy is the ability of an instrument to measure a true value, or how close a value is to the actual value. Precision is the ability of an instrument to read consistently. However, take note that you can be precise in the wrong answer. So it takes a little bit of both. You have to be accurate and precise to have a proper experiment. Selection bias. This is when subjects used in a study are not representative of the target population. So maybe you just pick things, maybe you picked your subjects improperly, or you didn't get a nice enough distribution of them. A detection bias results from educated professionals using their knowledge in an inconsistent way, basically equating different results based on knowledge that may not be consistent throughout the experiment. Observation bias is the behavior states that the behavior of stu study participants is altered simply because they recognize that they are being studied, or the Hawthorne effect. To put this into a more simpler term, when you visit your parents, you most definitely act differently than you do with your friends. That's observation bias in play. Your parents are observing you, so your behavior will change. Confounding. These are factors that alter the outcome of the experiment, and they posit a false correlation. So if you have confounding variables, they may skew your dependent variable and the results you'll see from your experiment. For most medical research, there is a human subject research portion with human test subjects. When it comes to the experimental approach of these, you have to make sure that there is randomization, some form of blinding, and proper data analysis. Randomization attempts to ensure that the test group is more representative. It also keeps researchers from picking subjects based on what they would prefer, thus eliminating individual biases. Blinding is another attempt to remove a bias. A single blind is when either the participant or the observer is blinded, so they don't know whether they're the control or the experimental group. A double blind is when both participant and observer are blinded. 
data analysis can take form in many different ways, and we covered a lot of that in the psychology portion, so I won't go into it too, in too much detail here. So we went through the experimental, now let's go to the observational. Observational approaches can take form in three different ways that are common in research with human subjects. Cohort studies observe subjects that are sorted into two groups based on differences in the risk factors, so depending on what you're studying. Cross-sectional studies attempt to categorize patients into groups at a single point in time. So at a given moment, where are these patients at in these different groups? Case control studies are when subjects with or without a particular outcome are identified. Researchers will then work backwards to find if there are possible similarities and correlations between these subjects with or without this outcome. Be careful though. As you might guess, with case control studies, it's easy to find correlations that are not necessarily true. Note that there is a distinction between causation and correlation. This brings us to Hill's criteria. Hill's criteria is a way to measure if the components of an observed relationship are the causality of the relationship. So it's basically a way to suggest whether or not a relationship is a correlation and not just a coincidence. There are different factors that go into Hill's criteria when we're evaluating this. The first is temporality. The exposure must occur before the outcome in order for it to be a correlation. Strength. As more variability in the outcome is explained by the variability in the study, the relationship is more likely to be causal. So more of an outcome can be described by more of the relationship. Dose response. As the study of the independent variable increase, there is a proportional increase in response. If this is consistent, there is a likelihood of causation. Also, the relationship has to be consistent and plausible. Plausibility is basically stating that there has to be a reasonable mechanism that links the two variables. If there isn't, we can't say that there is a relationship. Continue on with Hill's criteria, let's, talk into, let's go into the last four bits, the fir starting with the consideration of alternative explanations. As a scientist, you have to take into account every possible reason. If all other possible explanations can be eliminated, then your remaining explanation is probably more likely. If, if you can experiment to confirm this causality, it is also more likely. Basically, if you can prove that there is a relationship. This is what the scientific method hinges on. Specificity states that the change in the dependent variable is only produced by the change to the independent variable, suggesting a direct relationship. And lastly, coherence. This states that the new data and hypothesis are consistent with the current state of scientific knowledge. Note that just because it isn't doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. For example, when Einstein came out with his theory of relativity, it was not coherent with the current status of scientific knowledge, which stated that time was not was a constant moving thing. When Einstein came out with his theory stating that time was relative, that shook everything up. But obviously, it was proven to be true, because now that is our current state of scientific knowledge. Keep in mind that all of these factors play a role in finding correlation and causation between independent and dependent variables. The last thing we're going to go into when it comes to human subject research is ethical principles. When you are conducting research on humans, it is important to take note these four principles. And you're going to take an, you're going to realize that these are also very similar to the oaths you're going to take as a physician. The first is respect for persons. This includes the need for honesty between the subject and the researcher, and you can't and to necessarily prohibit deception. This involves informed consent review boards, and making sure that vulnerable persons are protected. Confidentiality is also considered a part of respect for these persons, as is seeing as that they are going to be your test subjects. Justice is stating that we have to make sure that we are morally relevant and that the research applied and the execution of the research is done in the same way and consistent throughout. Non-maleficence. Non-maleficence, as the name suggests, states that things must be done without the intent for potential harm, basically stating that the benefit has to outweigh the bad. 
beneficence is the statement that you are to act in the patient's best interest or your research subject's best interest. When you're designing experiments that involve human test subjects, it is important to take these four into account. All right, so that'll do it for our physics module. You made it through another module series. Please join us in the next couple. You're almost there. Hang tough, and you'll be sure to do well when it comes time to take your test.